Today is March 30, 2017. I am Dr. Swapna Mohan from the Division of Policy and Education, OLA. And before we begin with our webinar today, on behalf of everyone here at OLA, I'd like to wish our dear friend and colleague, Susan Silk, on her birthday this week. Happy birthday, Susan. <laughs> And now, it's my great pleasure to welcome our speaker for today, Ellen Paul from the Ornithological Council, where she has been the executive director since 1998. The Ornithological Council is a consortium of 11 societies of ornithologists that spans the Western Hemisphere and the members of those societies study birds everywhere in the world. Her role also includes assisting individual researchers with permit requirements, obtaining expertise for IACUCs, and working with other scientific societies whose members study other taxa. Ellen earned her law degree from Villanova University and a master's degree in conservation biology from the University of Maryland. She is the co-editor of the Guidelines to the Use of Wild Birds in Research and has also co-authored the Model Wildlife Protocol. And also with us today is Dr. Axel Wolf, Director of the Division of Compliance, OLA. They are going to talk today about wildlife research permits and what IACUCs need to know. Welcome to OLA, Ellen. Thank you very much. Uh, we can get started with the first slide. This is an antique permit issued to a very famous biologist named Frederick Lincoln, and this is a good illustration of one of the earliest permits. Today, almost every form of ornithological research and most of the research involving other taxa requires at least one permit. Next slide, please. To go over the major research permits for wildlife research conducted within the United States, they are the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, Endangered Species Act, Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and there are other non-regulatory restrictions such as the Airborne Hunting Act. The purpose of laws that are implemented through permits is primarily to protect wildlife populations by placing a limit on the number of animals that can be studied. And that limit is based on the population status of that species in that place. Place is a flexible concept because it depends on the species. Some species have very narrow or small ranges. Others are nationwide. So when you try to implement these limits, you have to consider each species to be studied. For birds, the estimation of population sizes as well as population estimates for any species listed under the Endangered Species Act, these estimates are derived from a wide variety of surveys and monitoring projects. For other taxa, such as amphibians, invertebrates, and so on, there may not be any population size estimates except for hunted species. For hunted species, we have an enormous number of very fine scale surveys because hunting limits are set anew each year. However, for non-hunted species, there is simply not enough funding to monitor wildlife populations other than those that are expressly protected under these laws. But the key point to be made here is that there are multiple layers of protection for wildlife populations, and those limits are based on the knowledge and expertise of the agencies charged with implementing those laws. Now, big reality check. In most studies, there is no lethal take or permanent removal of animals from the wild. Permanent removal means one of two things. Either the animals are taken live and then put into a captive situation to be studied, or they are euthanized and studied in a variety of ways, most typically from museum-based collections. Although there are various reasons for lethal take of individuals, such as toxicology studies, migration studies, and so on. I also want to note that there is occasionally some accidental mortality associated with wildlife studies. It could be one of the study animals, or it could be another animal that happens to be in the area. 
accidents do happen. These numbers are extremely low. We have some studies of certain types of methodologies that show the extent of take, and it is very, very low. It is almost zero for the purposes of population biology. In all studies involving removal of individuals from the wild, the number of individuals taken is exceedingly small. Now, it's also possible that a study may affect reproductive success, but many things affect reproductive success. So the likelihood that this very brief interaction that the researcher has with an individual or group of individuals is not likely to have any lasting effect even in that particular breeding season, much less over the lifetime of the individual. Generally, the impact associated with wildlife research is considered compensatory as opposed to additive. What this means is that the numbers are within the range of mortality that would be expected to occur from all causes. To underscore this point, in 1997, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service drafted a policy with regard to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. In this policy, they stated, quote, the numbers of birds collected in the United States for scientific study are extremely low compared with other categories of human-related activities and apparently have had no obvious or significant impact on species or local populations, end quote. As of March 2017, this policy has not yet been finalized. It is still in draft. Next slide. To find out how many birds are removed from the population under Migratory Bird Treaty Act permits, I requested data through the Freedom of Information Act for a five-year period from 1998 to 2002. I counted the numbers for each species taken across all of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service regions and totaled them up. You can see that the numbers for lethal take are extremely low. Only the top two lines on this table show over 100 individuals taken, and these are species with populations in the millions or tens of millions. Below that are numbers in the tens of birds. In some cases, only one or two birds will be taken of a given species. So you can see for yourself that these numbers are extremely low, and there is no way that these numbers will have any impact on any populations unless they were all taken from one extremely small population. But as you will see later, there are other permits or permit conditions that will prevent that from happening. So the basics of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. It's, a 100 and, it's 101 years old this year. It includes all native species. The name is actually misleading, and this is a very important point for Iacuxin researchers. It has nothing to do with actual migration of birds. It is a historical reference to the treaty itself, first signed with the United Kingdom, then later Mexico, Japan, and what was the Soviet Union. There is an official list of species that are protected under this law. It does change periodically, but as of 2017, it covers 1,026 species. This is an official list, and it is published and updated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The reason I say this is a key point for IACUX and researchers is that there are researchers, usually people who have less experience with research on wild birds, who mistakenly think that the term migratory refers to actual migration. And they believe that because the species they want to study doesn't migrate, they don't need a permit. That is not correct. And if the IACUC is told that no permit is needed, for a protocol that involves any form of capture of wild birds in the United States, the IACUC should question this statement. Tell the researchers to call the Ornithological Council for clarification on MBTA. The general provisions of the MBTA. The MBTA is implemented through a regulation in the Code of Federal Regulations, and it says, quote, no person may take, possess, import, export, transport, sell, purchase, barter, or offer for sale, purchase, or barter, any migratory bird, or the parts, nests, or eggs of such bird, except as may be permitted under the terms of a valid permit. 
The translation here is that you need a permit to do anything except to observe, use playback, do surveys, or monitoring. If you need to capture a bird, you need a permit. There is an important exception in the regulations, and that is that certain kinds of institutions may acquire by gift or purchase birds that are protected under this law or their parts, their nests, and their eggs without a permit. These are public educational or scientific institutions. This applies to permits that are issued to institutions, not to individual researchers at those institutions. So if your researcher has a permit that has been issued to the entire department or to the university, this exception could apply. But if it's issued in their own name, it would not apply. It's also important to note that the term public is not used in the commonly used sense. The regulatory definition of public, as used here, is an institution that is open to the general public and either established, maintained, and operated as a governmental service or that is privately endowed and organized, but not operated for profit. So it's actually a very wide number of institutions. There are different types of MBT per, TA, MBTA permits that are used for research. The first is scientific collecting, and that includes permanent removal of an individual from the population. That permit could be used to keep the bird alive, to study it in captivity, or it could be the take of a bird through euthanasia for various types of studies. It also includes the take of blood, feather, or tissues, but only if the bird is not also being marked in some manner, such as a bird band. Scientific collecting also includes salvage of dead birds. And these permits are issued by the regional offices of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. There is a separate permit needed to band or mark a bird. There are various ways to mark birds. These, can, uh, these permits can also include blood and feather sampling if you request it, and as long as the bird is also going to be marked or banded. This permit also includes salvage of dead birds. These permits are issued by the U.S. Geological Survey's Bird Banding Lab. Now, I should note that the reason it's important that these permits include salvage is that salvage birds are donated to museums and teaching institutions. So it helps to further reduce the number of birds that museums and universities have to take from the wild for their studies. There are also import and export permits issued by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. There are also special purpose permits for activities that are not covered by other specific permit types. For example, if you want to move nests or translate egg, translocate eggs and young birds. An important thing to note is that under the regulations, the this regulation, the activity that is permitted may continue even if the permit expires. So long as the permittee has applied for renewal at least 30 days prior to the expiration date. This is important for two reasons. The first is that we are seeing a reduction in staff in these offices which means it will take longer to get these permits issued. We advise people to start applying for their permits or their renewals in February, allowing 90 days, which is quite a while for a permit to be renewed. But with the worsening staffing shortages, it might take longer. So if somebody's permit has expired, and here we're just talking about MBTA permits, as long as they have applied for renewal at least 30 days prior to expiration, under this law, they may continue to do the work that is authorized under that permit. The other key point that I want to make here is that we have a mismatch in terminology. It leads to researchers some, sometimes mistakenly thinking that they do not need a permit. Here, that term is scientific collecting. Researchers use that term to mean the permanent removal of an individual from the wild, either for study in captivity or more commonly via lethal take. The federal and state agencies use that same term to mean collecting anything that is part of a bird, feathers that you pick up from the ground, nests that are no longer being used. And so we sometimes get researchers, especially those who are new to the field, thinking that since they are not taking a bird from the wild, they don't need a permit. That is entirely wrong, and they do need a permit. If somebody is doing so without the permits, 
question them and suggest they contact the Ornithological Council. We work with individual researchers every day of the week to help prevent this kind of problem. We also have publications on our website as well as, and, as well, and these can also answer any questions that you might have on these regulations. One thing that is important to note if you are on an IACUC, because it may impact the review of your protocol, is that neither Migratory Bird Treaty Act nor Endangered Species Act permits allow euthanasia except obviously for lethal take um, under the kinds of permits that are needed for scientific research. That conflicts with a requirement in the Animal Welfare Act regulations that says that animals that would otherwise experience severe or chronic pain or distress that cannot be relieved will be painlessly euthanized at the end of the procedure or if appropriate during the procedure. Now, the Ornithological Council has discussed this problem with the Fish and Wildlife Service. They recognize the problem. However, they have suggested that we wait until the issue of rapid cardiac compression, which was formerly known as thoracic compression, is resolved in terms of the AVMA guidelines for euthanasia. In 2017, a, a research paper has been accepted and should be published soon. Uh, while it is not a guarantee that the AVMA will reclassify this method, we hope that will be the outcome. And once this method is reclassified, we will ask the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to include a condition on the permits that does allow for euthanasia. We now move on to the Endangered Species Act, which can cover all taxa of wildlife and plants. It was enacted in 1973. As of 2017, there are 81 species in the United States that are listed as endangered and 18 that are listed as threatened. Endangered species are given a higher degree of protection than are threatened species. There are also 214 species outside of the United States that are listed as endangered and 17 outside the United States that are listed as threatened. There are some bird species that are listed as both Migratory Bird Treaty Act and ESA, some that are listed both as MBTA and CITES, which we'll get to soon, and some that are all three. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a procedure for issuing single permits in these cases. The Endangered Species Act permits that are needed for research are called recovery permits. In some circumstances, a researcher may need an Endangered Species Act permit even if they are not studying an endangered species because the research methods may impact an endangered species in the area. As of 2017, there is no official guidance on this topic. It is actually a problem because the type of permit needed for what is called incidental take, meaning incidental to some otherwise lawful activity, has to be accompanied by a habitat protection plan. Clearly, a researcher who does not own the land can do nothing to conserve habitat. So what is needed is an in-between permit type. The Ornithological Council is talking with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service about this problem, and we are hoping that they will come up with some other permit type that will accommodate the problem. Meanwhile, the U.S. Bird Banding Lab has offered some unofficial guidance, which so far has been working quite well. Basically, they say, quote, authorization to capture or mark species designated as endangered or threatened is granted only to persons engaged in research dealing with those species. If you band in a place where you have or are likely to catch an endangered or threatened species, you should obtain an endangered species permit. If the applicant's research project is valid and feasible and the comments received are generally favorable, a permit will be issued, here they mean a banding permit, to mark specific endangered species. So what they're basically saying is that we recognize this problem and here's how we handle it. This is just their process and it has never been approved by the Division of Endangered Species. So as of 2017, this is an open question. And the interesting thing from your point of view is that the question only comes up if you happen to be studying a species for which a permit is needed. If you are studying a non-endangered mammal or an amphibian, you have no interaction with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at all. 
And unless the researcher goes to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, if they happen to spot an endangered species in their research area, I, I can assure you no one ever does that. Next slide, please. Okay. The next, the next type of permit is the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. It's very straightforward. You need a permit if you want to do any of these things. Shoot, shoot at, poison, wound, kill, capture, trap, collect, molest, or disturb a bald eagle or a golden eagle. The word disturb has a fairly broad definition. Here it means to agitate or bother a bald or golden eagle to a degree that causes or is likely to cause, based on the best scientific information available, injury to an eagle or a decrease in productivity by substantially interfering with normal breeding, feeding, or sheltering behavior, or nest abandonment by substantially interfering with normal breeding, feeding, or sheltering behavior. The final federal permit type I'd like to discuss today is the Marine Mammal Protection Act. It was enacted in 1972. Jurisdiction is split between two agencies. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is, is responsible for manatees, polar bears, sea otters, walruses, and dugongs, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration handles cetacea, which are whales and porpoises, pinnipedia, other than walruses, meaning seals and sea lions. The Fish and Wildlife Service has an incidental harassment authorization, which is a very informal process. It allows for harassment that is incidental to otherwise lawful activity. If a small number of anim if it's involving a small number of animals and the take is limited to harassment, that is, if you are not going to capture anything, mark anything, there will be no experimental manipulation of any kind, no bi biopsies, and so on. These are available for up to one year in duration. They do require publication in the Federal Register so the public can comment on them. And then if they are authorized, they're issued within 40 days of the close of the public comment period. That's the desired length of time, but with staffing shortages, these deadlines simply don't hold very well anymore. The Fish and Wildlife permits that are issued under the Marine Mammal Protection Act are covered by the Code of Federal Regulations. They are scientific research permits that are based on the need to further a bona fide and necessary or desirable scientific purpose, taking into account the benefits anticipated to be derived from the scientific research contemplated and the effect of the purposed taking or importation on the population stock and the marine ecosystem. And what this means is that this permit is issued for the purpose of allowing research, but also for the purpose of protecting the population. The permits issued by NOAA for the Marine Mammal Protection Act also have two levels. The first is a letter of confirmation. It is for low-level harassment, which is called Level B harassment. There are activities such as photo identification, behavioral observations, aerial surveys, and passive acoustics, which simply means listening for sound rather than trying to evoke a response to an auditory stimulus. It is a simpler and faster process than applying for a regular research permit, and NOAA suggests that you apply four to six months before the start of the proposed field work. There are certain things that cannot be authorized under a, le a letter of confirmation, and, on pinniped, and these are pinniped rookeries or even observations. That's because these animals are very sensitive to having other mammals walking among them because rookeries are where they have their young. Other activities are import and export of marine mammals or their parts and research such as tagging or biopsy sampling that would exceed a level B harassment. So for those activities, the second level of a NOAA permit, I think you're a slide ahead. The second level of a NOAA permit is called a level A harassment where there is potential for injury to a marine mammal or marine mammal stock in the wild. The time required to get one of these permits is longer. It is at least six months in advance of the intended research start date. All of these permits are for species that are not also listed as endangered. 
NOAA will often do an environmental impact an environmental assessment or sometimes even a full environmental impact statement if the research is subject of con public controversy based on potential consequences. Underwater sonar testing is a very good example. Or that have uncertain environmental impacts or unknown risks or that may result in cumulatively significant impacts, such as if they may impact a large number of animals, or that may have an adverse effect upon endangered or threatened species or their habitats. Now, these are not endangered species permits, but it, only if the activity may also impact endangered species that happen to be present, and then NOAA may do these assessments. Now, we also have Marine Mammal Protection Act listed species that are also listed on the Endangered Species Act. For both the Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA, the application form used is the same, but additional scrutiny is given by the agency. NOAA will take as much as a full year to issue such permits. In addition to the species-based permits, almost all research requires place-based permits. At the federal level, a permit is required for work in any federally managed public land, including national parks, national wildlife refuges, national forests, grasslands, and many other types. The exception is the Bureau of Land Management, but it isn't that you don't need a permit from BLM. It's just that as of 2017, the BLM has a very limited system of permits that are used only for their most sensitive lands. Most agencies have an informal authorization system for research that will have limited impact. So if you just want to go out and misnet birds and put bans on them, odds are pretty good that once you ask them if you need a permit to work on that park or work in that refuge, they'll write you a letter saying that you don't. They just need to know where you are going and when you are going to be there. That's for your safety and also to prevent user conflicts and to be sure that what you are doing doesn't interfere with their management activities. But the permit system, the place-based permit system, assuming you need a permit, is a very complex system and it requires a rigorous analysis by the agency. Every state requires a place-based permit as well, but the purposes for these is somewhat different. The primary purpose is to foster public safety to limit damage to natural resources and to prevent user conflict. And this, of course, is incredibly important during hunting season. The states will issue the permits and require that you give advance notice every time you are planning to go out and the time and the location where you will be. State agencies also analyze the impact of your activity on the wildlife. This is particularly true for mammals and other taxa other than birds. And that's because they recognize that you, for birds, you already have an MBTA permit issued by the federal agency. They are not as likely to second guess that federal permit as to be concerned about species for which no federal permits are required. Finally, researchers, like everyone else, require permission to enter and conduct research activities on private property. There are a number of permits that are issued to import and export animals, whether live animals or specimens or parts of animals. The vast majority of research imports and exports are specimens and samples, not live animals. These include all of the permits we've already gone over. And in addition, there are the Wild Bird Conservation Act, the Convention on International Trade in, in, in Endangered Species, the Lacey Act, which is enforcement of foreign laws via permits from those countries. And APHIS also has a series of permits that are issued for all birds, live or dead, and some mammals. So let's go through a few of those. Uh, there are also, by the way, some additional non-permit requirements, such as the Nagoya Protocol, which is an international treaty intended to protect intellectual property rights. The US has never signed it, so it's not clear how it will be implemented in the United States at this point. However, because it is a law in other countries, according to the Lacey Act, we have to enforce it in some manner. So for imports and exports, there are two basic issues. The first one is enforcement of US laws, international treaties, and foreign laws intended to protect populations. So if you are going to another country and you want to bring back wildlife samples or specimens back to your museum,
You must have permits issued by the government of the country where you are working. You must also have an export permit from those countries. Often those are combined on one permit, but sometimes they're not. It's very important that researchers know what their permits say. The second purpose of an importer export permit is to prevent the introduction of non-native wildlife under the Lacey Act and pathogens under the Animal Health Protection Act. The Lacey Act is a for fairly old statute going back to the early 1900s. It has been amended several times and it now does three different things. First, it prohibits import except by permit of listed non-native species that could be injurious to the interests of agriculture, horticulture, wildlife, or wildlife resources. As of 2017, there are only three bird species and their eggs that are listed and very few other animals. The second thing it does is to protect the laws of other countries that are intended to protect wildlife populations in those countries by making it a crime to import in violation of the laws of that other country. So when somebody is at the U.S. border, they, only, they need not only the permits that are required by the United States for import, but also the permits that are required by the other country for having taken the wildlife and for exporting the wildlife. The Lacey Act also has a very rudimentary provision regarding humane transport under which the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has adopted the International Air Transport Association regulations for air transport of live animals. There are several major statutes here that have import-export requirements that we have already gone through, so I'm going to focus on the ones we haven't talked about yet. The first is the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. It went into force in 19, 1977, and the United States is a member. It controls the import and export of listed species. It does not have anything to do with what happens once they are legally inside the United States. A species can be listed under the Endangered Species Act and CITES, and if they are, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a procedure for issuing a single permit for the both. The basics of CITES is that it has to involve international trade. It has nothing to do with what goes on within a country's borders. The type of permit you need and the procedures that are needed to get it and use it depends on whether the species is listed on Appendix 1, 2, or 3. Appendix 1 lists the most imperiled species and requires both import and export permits. Appendix 2 lists somewhat less imperiled species and requires only an export permit. Appendix 3 are species that are listed only in specific countries and require only an export permit from those countries. Scientific institutions can register for exchanges with other registered institutions, and in those cases, no permits are needed. Finally, there's the Wild Bird Conservation Act, and this is actually the one that most IACUCs will probably want to know about because it covers live birds. It covers all of the bird species listed under CITES, except for the common parakeet, or budgie as some people call it, cockatiels, and nine other bird families. Permits can be issued for scientific research. If you haven't heard about it, the reason is probably because it is far easier and more efficient to study them in the country of origin, particularly if the study involves questions that are best addressed in the wild. The amount of effort and money it takes to import live birds, especially in this time of highly pathogenic avian influenza, is extremely difficult. We actually advise people to study birds in their country of origin rather than try to import live birds. In addition to all of the federal permits, every single state has some permit requirement. Some are very basic, while some, such as California, are highly restrictive. With state permits, generally one permit covers all activities and they are usually called scientific collecting. And again, I want to highlight this mismatch in terminology. Scientists do not use that term so broadly. Therefore, scientists might not realize that they require permits because they're not doing collection in the scientific sense. The Ornithological Council has the permit regulations of all 50 states on our website. There are some states that do not require banding permits if the only marking to be used is the federal bird band. 
State laws and permits can be of concern to an IACUC for another reason, and that is because they almost always prohibit release of wild animals that have been taken into captivity for research. This can be a problem if you are filing, following the ILAR guide because it specifies, quote, when species are removed from the wild, the protocol should include plans either for a return to their habitat or their final disposition as appropriate, end quote. When you are talking about a healthy individual, you don't necessarily think of euthanasia as appropriate. But if the permit does not allow return to the wild, then euthanasia is often, unfortunately, the only choice. Next slide. It is not really the job of the IACUC to keep the faculty and students out of jail, but this boils down to a practical question. The researcher can't control the timing of the issuance of permits, so permits may not be in hand at the time the protocol is reviewed. So the question is, should an IACUC require that the researcher submit copies of the permits once issued? Now, OLAW does not usually recommend the conditional approval of animal use protocols. You may get the protocol approved by the IACUC, but by law, you cannot start the work until you have the permit. Some institutions require the investigator to provide all permits prior to or at the time of protocol review or prior to approval, which may not be practical. You may not get the permit until a few days prior to the time that work is supposed to begin. And for wildlife research, this time is not flexible. Research is generally dictated by the season, especially for migratory species. So are you supposed to just set the protocol aside and wait? The best practice to resolve this practical dilemma is for the researcher to submit the protocol, listing the required permits, and giving the status for each, whether you have the permit, have applied, or will apply. If the IACUC finds the protocol to be otherwise acceptable, the best practice for the IACUC would be to indicate in writing that the protocol has been approved, but that the animal work is not to begin until required permits are obtained. And according to OLAW, this practice is acceptable. Yes, and let me add that OLAW recommends this practice. That is, IACUCs can review protocols, and if it is appropriate to do so, approve them. However, the work cannot begin until the permits are received. I wouldn't necessarily call this a conditional approval, because while the researchers know that they can't touch the animals without a permit, the protocol itself has been approved by the IACUC. We have similar situations where an institution gets grant money, but they cannot begin any animal work until an IACUC approval is obtained. I just, to put a fine point on this, it is a federal offense to conduct research involving activities that would require a federal permit if the researcher does not have a valid permit. Depending on the statute, there are civil and criminal penalties, including fines and even incarceration. And at the very least, it is likely that the researcher will be ineligible for future permits for some time or even perma permanently. I'm going to change subjects now and address the issue of population level impacts on the study animals. This seems to come up in protocol reviews and it may be the source of a little bit of friction. If you read the Animal Welfare Act, the Health Research Extension Act, the Public Health Service Policy, the U.S. Government Principles, and the ILAR Guide, there's nothing that requires an IACUC to consider the potential population level impact of wildlife studies. All are silent on this subject. So why are IACUCs delving into this question? Arguably, it could be seen as a corollary of the requirement to use the minimum number of animals necessary to obtain valid results. OLA doesn't require IACUCs to review the population level impact of any study. However, in cases of studies on limited secluded populations, the IACUC is well within its rights to question the impact of the research activities on that population. And here I'd like to do another reality check. This inquiry is likely to have little value. Most field research methods involve no removal of individuals from the wild or will have any lasting impact on survival and reproduction. 
Moreover, population level impacts are very difficult to predict. The researcher may not have sufficient knowledge of population sizes and species interactions. There may be no published information. No sense, and a census, even if it is possible or practical, will not yield sufficient information. The bottom line is that the impacts, if any, are far too speculative to warrant a review by the IACUC. To know uh, uh, a single census at a given point in time will not produce useful population impact estimates because wild populations can fluctuate wildly, widely, not wildly, widely over seasons and years. You can see that, that living anywhere in the United States. One day you have no robins and the next day your yard is filled with robins. So which of these represents the population size of American robins? Population sizes can also change for a wide variety of reasons, and it would be virtually impossible to attribute a change in population size to a given research protocol, because protocols are typically of short duration and involve, generally involve very few animals. Furthermore, the IACUC review of these kinds of concerns would also require that the IACUC members have sufficient understanding of quantitative population biology to assess the available data, and the time to do the analysis, or to review the researcher's assessment or data analysis. I want to reiterate here that permits protect populations. Population level impacts are difficult to predict. The researcher may not have enough information to even be able to tell you what the impacts are, much less what the population sizes are. The population sizes change for a variety of reasons, and it would be impossible to say that this population declined because of a small study that took place for three or five years, three to five years. And that is the duration of most studies, anywhere from three to five years. And the ability of the IACUC to review the researcher's own analyses of population impacts is pretty limited, unless you happen to be a quantitative population biologist. They are also unique to each species and each research condition in which the field researcher is working. So the permits are issued by agency staffers who do have knowledge of population status and trends. Permit approval means that the officials have determined that the take needed for the study will not be detrimental to the population or that any population level impact is justified by the value of the knowledge to be gained. Remember, the kind of information that we are generating is the kind of information that these agencies use for conservation and management of wildlife. And where multiple permits are issued, the IACUC has even greater guarantee because these permits mean that at least two different agencies, generally one at the federal level and the other more local, have considered the potential impacts. Now let's talk about other animals in the study area. Because we are out in the wild, there are other organisms out there. Therefore, there is a potential for research to impact animals not actually used in the study. They may be part of the population from which the study animals are drawn, or they may be other species in the area that may be affected by the researcher's presence or the study methods. The classic example here would be a mist net. A mist net can catch whatever flies into it, not just the species being studied. The researcher may choose to release it without putting a band on it, or for other reasons may put a band on it. But whatever the action, they have now impacted animals other than the ones they are studying. Now remember, if there are endangered species in the area, then you get back into this area of unresolved problem of endangered species permits. Otherwise, the same analysis that I have been going through really applies. Most field research methods involve no removal from, of individuals from the wild or have no lasting impacts on survival and reproduction. This is an issue that can cause confusion for IACUCs. The issue of bycatch or inadvertent capture of other species should be considered by the IACUC, especially in regard to aquatic species. Often hundreds of extra fish and other water animals not needed for the research are caught and this needs to be addressed in the protocol. OLA sometimes receives non-compliance reports on this topic. The specific problem is either the capture of species not listed on the protocol and or the capture of many more target species than approved. 
Following capture, difficulties may arise with trying to release a large number of animals from traps or nets in a humane and timely fashion to avoid distress or death. From personal experience, when I was mist netting for bats, I caught owls, large tropical moths, and other species that needed to be carefully removed and released. Protocols need to be amended to account for different species or excess numbers of animals captured. Thank you. Going to switch now to an entirely different type of federal permit, and that is APHIS permits. These permits are probably not going to be of major concern to the IACUCs because while they do cover live animals, it is becoming increasingly rare to import live animals to the United States for research, partly because of the, I the APHIS permits. The purpose of these permits is to prevent the introduction of pathogens that can harm U.S. livestock or agriculture. For birds, there are only two at the moment that they are concerned about, and these are exotic Newcastle disease, which is actually velogenic viscerotropic Newcastle, or any form of highly pathogenic avian influenza. You may be wondering why, since we've had at least two outbreaks of HPAI, one currently ongoing in Tennessee. The reality is we've had bouts of exotic Newcastle as well. The USDA has imposed a quarantine that prevents movement of animals from the affected areas and eradicates these, these poultry barns by depopulation. Once they're convinced that it has been eradicated, they lift the quarantine. So even though we have had incidences of these two diseases in the United States, they have been contained and eradicated, and so they are still considered to be foreign pathogens. For mammals, the current diseases of concern are foot and mouth disease, rinderpest, which has actually been declared eradicated in the wild by the World Health Organization, classical swine fever, African swine fever, swine vesicular disease, and African horse sickness. APHIS regulates birds plus all ruminants, equids, suidae, which is pigs, and tenrex. The CDC also regulates imports of animals that carry pathogens, but the pathogens of interest there are those that can be harmful to human health, and there are really very few at the moment. Imported birds must go through USDA quarantine and testing. No live birds can be imported from any countries or regions where high path avian influenza occurs, which is now almost all of Asia, most of Africa, some regions of Mexico, and some parts of Canada. For a short time, Australia as well. APHIS has what's called an all-in, all-out system. If even one bird tests positive in any one of the tests, the entire import is euthanized. And this is part of the reason that I tell our members that it is far easier and more effective to go to that country and study the birds there. It is becoming increasingly difficult to get these birds into the United States. Moreover, quarantine space is extremely limited. It is logistically very difficult to get quarantine space for live birds. So this is something we highly discourage. In addition to the quarantine procedures, the live birds must have veterinary health certificates from a government official of the country of origin. So chances are pretty good that they have gone through quarantine and testing at that end as well. Uh, finally, uh, we do need permits for specimens and samples. This is not something that will involve the IACUC unless the samples were taken from live birds, of course. Uh, but specimens and samples from birds and certain mammals also require permits from APHIS. It is called an APHIS VS, which stands for Veterinary Services, 16-3 permit. The permit conditions vary depending on the disease condition and the pathogen. Just to give you one example, any bird specimen or sample coming from a country where any form of HPAI is present must be treated to inactivate the virus using a USDA-approved treatment method. However, if the bird is coming from a country where exotic Newcastle, but not HPAI, is present, it can be imported untreated into a USDA-certified biosafety level 2 lab. But if that lab is not USDA certified as biosafety level 2, then the import must be treated. The only real concern here of the IACUC would be the protocol for taking these samples from live animals in the wild. I'm just focusing on permits related to import here. And we're going to switch gears just a little bit here and conclude with um, some information about the status of the APHIS rats, mice, and birds regulation. It's nothing to do with permits, but I get this question all the time, so we thought it would be a good idea to address it here. 
You may remember that in 2004, a final rule was issued by APHIS to include rats, mice, and birds that are not bred for use in research in the regulatory definition of animal. Prior to that time, they had excluded these taxa. Also in 2004, they issued an advance notice of public rulemaking, which basically says we're going to write rules and standards for these taxa. They took public comments. They received over 7,400 comments. In 2011, they issued a fact sheet. In 2012, they said they had begun to revise their own internal documents and were evaluating implementation issues, especially those pertaining to birds. This involved feasibility issues such as how many entities do we need to inspect, what kind of variation will we find, what type of birds will we find, what type of research facilities, and so on. There was concern at that time about the additional resources and training needed by regulated entities and by animal care personnel. As of 2017, that situation has not changed. The USDA has been occupied with other federal regulations, and there frankly hasn't been much pressure from animal welfare, uh, the animal welfare community. And they, along with the USDA, recognize the problems with the APHIS inspections, that, that, that birds in captivity are not being inspected by APHIS. Finally, I'm sure many of you have questions about some of the research that's being done at your institutions. These questions tend to be very specific and not easily applied from one situation to another. So if you or your researchers need help, please contact me directly at the email link or phone number provided here. I'd like to thank Olaf for affording us this opportunity, and I look forward to receiving many phone calls and emails from all of you. Thank you, Ellen. And with that, we have now come to the end of our online seminar on wildlife permits. I'd like to remind the listeners that if you have questions for us, you can submit them via the link provided on the OLA webinars page or by email at oladpe at mail.nih.gov. Thank you to Ellen Paul and Dr. Axel Wolf for a wonderful talk. And I thank all of you for participating in our webinar. Goodbye, and thank you for joining us today.